morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Arjita Sethi, and I'm the founder of New Founders School, where I help immigrant founders and first-time founders uh, get help around launching their businesses. I'm a professor, an angel investor, and an advisory board member of NASDAQ's Entrepreneurial Center. Uh, for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. The NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with founding partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. Create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with the in-the-moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, geographies. Together, we will build the greatest exchange of knowledge and expertise in service to entrepreneurs in business today. Find or become a mentor today by using the link in the chat that's been given already. Entrepreneurs are the dreamers, the doers, the visionaries who are not just solving the problems our community and world face today, but those that will create a better future for us all. Mentorship matters. I know that to all entrepreneurs, their success is dependent on it. And we will open for a live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. During these unique times, we are curious how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. We would like to start today by taking a poll to let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. So let's go with poll one. How are you feeling today? Fearful, anxious, surviving, optimistic. Fearful, anxious, surviving, optimistic. And we're going to share the results as you can see. Oh, that's amazing, optimistic. I like seeing that. But we do have some who are in the surviving phase as well. Second poll is what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales, marketing, scaling, pivot, team, or just surviving? Awesome, as you can see the results on the screen again. Perfect, thank you so much for being a part of those polls and sharing what's on your mind. But today we welcome Carolyn Rods, an investment banker turned three-time award-winning Latina entrepreneur from Bolivia. She is CEO and co-founder of Hello Alice, a free multi-channel platform powered by AI technology, guiding business owners by providing access to funding, networks, and services. During her time at Hello Alice, Carolyn was recognized as the 17 women to watch by Inc. Magazine and named Hispanic CEO of the year by Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in 2020. She was selected by Mayor Turner of Houston to co-chair the Women and Minority Small Business Task Force in 2019. She has testified before the U.S. Congressional House Small Business Committee, and she was featured in the U.S. Senate report by Senator Shaheen titled, Tackling the Gender Gap, What Women Entrepreneurs Need to Thrive. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest, Carolyn Rods. Thank you, Arjita. Thanks everybody for joining today. Excited to chat with all of you. Yeah, same here, Carolyn. I am so like, this is my mission. I'm an immigrant founder and I want to talk to more immigrant founders. So this is a very, very special conversation for me. And I'd love to dig in a little, um, 
to the power of the origin story of Hello Alice, as it's key to our conversation on mentorship and support today. Can you share with us a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur and what led you to create Hello Alice? Sure. Well, I'll say to all of you who are fearful and anxious and in survival mode, uh, I've been there and I feel for you. Uh, and, and know that there is optimism on the other side. I, I started my first business over 15 years ago after leaving a career in investment banking, uh, where I worked at JP Morgan in their M&A group. I really, I jumped into entrepreneurship quite blind, to be honest. My father was an entrepreneur, my grandparents were entrepreneurs, uh, but it's very different when you're doing it yourself. And so I started a company in the retail space, ended up closing that after two years. And uh, frankly, I had a really, really tough time. I was broke at that point. I'd spent all my lovely bonuses from my investment banking days on this business. I always call it my unofficial MBA because I spent as much as an Ivy League education and, and learned a lot. Uh, so I started my second business, really convinced that my, I wasn't going to let my entrepreneurial journey end with failure because I, I looked everywhere and I saw all these companies that were thriving around me and wondered what I had done wrong. And so I spent some time just studying and learning the landscape. And when we talk about mentorship, that was my objective was I wanted to learn from everybody around me uh, of what, what was the secret to this success. And so I started a second company in the digital media space that I ultimately sold after seven years and decided I was gonna give back and kind of share a lot of the things that I'd learned along the way uh, and so I started informally with some mentorship, more formally, as I realized that needed to scale a little bit into a virtual accelerator for women and people of color. That quickly became the fastest growing uh, accelerator for those demographics. And it, we still couldn't get enough scale. And so I was like, all right, how do we step back and actually serve millions of entrepreneurs? recognizing that the issues that women and people of color are facing are actually the same issues that every single entrepreneur faces. It's really hard to understand how you navigate this incredibly crazy journey. Um, it's a really unique journey for every single entrepreneur. Right. And so that was the, the impetus for starting Hello Alice. Oh my God. I, there are so many questions in my mind right now. Like I, I could literally pick threads and, and there's so much similarity, the things that you talked about, you know, uh, your savings and going, going forward and, and this pseudo MBA that we all founders do through this process, which is way more expensive. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Carmen. Um, today is also the Equal Pay Day, which is not just a day for like, women to come together and share their ideas for the change we deserve, but an opportunity for men to step up and advocate for women as well. Um, and, and I wanted to know from you, Carmen, how can men demonstrate their support if you have any ideas there? I think men are critical. When we talk about equality, um, we have to, to bring everybody to the table. And I, I'm very fortunate, I will say, um, I've certainly had my fair share of conversations where you sort of roll your eyes and throw your hands up in the air and say, what the heck is going on in this world? Uh, but we have a lot of men that have stood behind Hello Alice. I know we wouldn't be here as a company if it weren't for people like John Sheena from Silicon Valley Bank or Zoff Fett who sits on our board. Um, you know, both of who really made a bet on us and our business in the early days. Um, the reality is particularly when you're looking at investment capital, it is you know, predominantly male um, and, and it takes people to step up and advocate for you inside those circles so that you can start to break into them. Um, right. So I'm very, very grateful. I think men, you know, you know I th at the end of the day, look, I, I honestly find most people want to see people succeed in entrepreneurship. It's the American dream. It's what this country was based on. It's hard to look at a small business owner and say, you know, I really hope they fail. Not that many people do that. Uh, and, and so I think going into it with the mindset of, look, people, you know, they might not advocate for you, but they don't want to see you fail. And so raising your hand and making the ask is much easier when you sort of recognize that, you know, the worst you're going to get is a no, and it's really going to be a no because they're not willing to put the time and effort forth, forth to help you succeed. It's not a no because they don't believe in you or they don't want you to succeed. Exactly. Exactly. I, I love that perspective. 90% um, of the people on my cap table are men and they've really been my allies too. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to the mentorship and, and that piece that you shared in the origin story of Hello Alice. And, and mentorship is at the heart of the center's mission as well. So this is something very critical for us. 
who are some of your mentors and how did they change the trajectory of your entrepreneurial journey? You know, it's funny when I first started my career, I remember I showed up at JP Morgan and my managing director was like, you need, uh, you're the only woman on the team. And she was the only female in senior leadership. And she was like, you need a mentor. If you're going to navigate this corporation, you need a mentor and you need a female mentor. And there's none in this group except for me. And I don't have time, but I'm going to hook you up with someone across. And it was, you know, 20 departments away in a different building far away. And it was a very formal mentorship program. I remember feeling so uncomfortable because I really had no personal connection with this woman who was in a totally different stage of life. We had nothing in common other than the fact that we were women. And it sort of felt like this very corporate, like we're going to put you in a room. And, you know, it's like when somebody tells you like, oh, like you're gay and that person's gay. You, you should be together. Like, it's like, there's really like, there's a lot of gay people out there. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be together just because yeah. uh, it felt like that. And so I, I really, um, I would say I went in a little bit skeptical to the idea of mentorship early on in my career because of that lovely woman. She was great. She was very helpful, but just wasn't, you know, again, there wasn't a whole lot of value that either of us could add to one another. Fast forward, I think as you know, I, the way I look at mentorship today is entirely around, it's all of the relationships that you're building, right? You're building this network of people that can support and that you can support. Yeah. Um, and it's just relationship building at the end of the day, right? I mean, my greatest mentors it, they're so varied. I just got off the phone earlier today with um, someone who I'd met through uh, the LBAN program that I did at Stanford for Hispanic entrepreneurs, who is a CFO. We're now hiring a CFO. And I called him and was like, look, I really want to dig into the role. How are you hired? What's compelling in the marketplace? How do I find the very best talent? And he gave me so much good advice. I mean, the fact that our, our 45 minute call, we're like, we need a part two because there's so much that you could download to me. So I think it's finding, you know, who is the best person to give you the greatest perspective on what you're trying to solve for. And that can come from anywhere. I've had mentors that are entrepreneurs that are frankly far earlier in their journey, but they know a specific segment or they operate in a specific market and they can help me a lot and vice versa. I can offer something to them. And so I, again, I, I really look at mentorship as it's, it's building relationships yeah. and valuing um, each of those relationships for what, what they can bring to, to both parties. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting that you are sharing that even now in your business, you look for that mentorship, you look for that network as well. And, and uh, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is at what stage of starting your entrepreneurial journey do you think, Arlen, is, is uh, it crucial to find a mentor, to get a mentor? And, and to all these founders who are listening, maybe it'll be a great inspiration for them as well to understand if they're at the right stage to get that mentorship. Uh, you are always at the right stage. I think no matter where you are in life, even if you haven't started your company yet, uh, you're at the right stage. I talked about my first company failing. And I honestly, the, the biggest learning that I took away from that was that I didn't ask for help. I came from investment banking. I felt like everything had to be polished and big and perfect before I could go raise my hand and ask for help. And so I kept waiting. I had this amazing network. I worked with you know, billion dollar CEOs across my career, yet I didn't make the phone call to say, hey, I'm starting a business. I would love your advice. And I always like kick myself for that because I'm like, God, if I had just asked them, I'm sure they would have saved me, frankly, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours of time, um, you know, the silver lining is I probably wouldn't have started the business I started today, uh, which I love and I'm so grateful for. So I guess everything happens for a reason. But yeah. uh, at every stage, I think mentorship is, is critical, but I think it evolves over time. I mean, in my early days, Elizabeth, my co-founder and I had a group of four women and we would get on the phone once a week and it was really all about accountability and we were mentoring each other through you know, these very early stage decisions about starting our business and what our value proposition was and how to get our website up and these really, you know, very significant decisions at the time, but things that now I look back and I'm like, okay, I can, it's sort of second nature to us. Yeah. Uh, it, it evolved. I think that group, I mean, we all kind of went off in our own directions and we're still friends, but we don't need the weekly conversation anymore. Yeah. Now it is, it's very specific needs that I have. So I mentioned my, my friend who's a CFO uh, that I picked the phone up and called, or, you know, we're in the middle of closing at our series B. And so it's, it's talking to people who have been through that path and have really scaled up, you know, we're doubling the size of our team over the next six months. And so it's, you know, I am calling everyone. I'm like, okay, we're going through this journey. Like, let's talk about talent acquisition. And I want to hear what were the big obstacles that you hit when you reached hundred employees? 
um, so that I'm starting to think ahead at, at what are the obstacles that we are going to hit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the thread that you're connecting. Mentorship is actually, you know, it, it could even be through your peers and through your own network as well. It's not just an expert in the field, which is amazing. And you shared this a little bit, uh, Carolyn, about I wish I would have asked for help. I, I was around and surrounded by these brilliant CEOs and successful people. What are the things that you would you would share with the founders so that they can learn from your experience? What are the things that you wish you would have known in addition to asking for help before or while starting out Hello Alice? I think the one of the greatest lessons I've learned has been from my co-founder, Elizabeth. Uh, and we're, we're really different. I love, I'm a very like detail oriented behind the scenes. I love building product. I love creating and, and just sort of envisioning. I'm, my, I live my life like a year ahead in every aspect. Elizabeth is an incredible relationship builder. And for her, everything is sort of speed and urgency and making sure you're, you're capitalizing on the window of opportunity that you have right in front of you. And so we're a brilliant sort of push and pull for each other on, on both of those uh, aspects. But with what I learned from her was the way that she was dealing with people because people love Elizabeth. She has this very magnetic personality. She, she brings people in early and often, but she follows up. She's very specific about what her ask is. So she will call somebody and say, look, I need X, Y, and Z. Can you help me? If they can't, she'll be like, all right, who who do you think could? And so it always inevitably opens the door, but she refers back or or circles back and closes the loop with every single person that she talks to immediately. So if she would, you know, call and ask for, look, I need, I'm looking for intros. We're raising capital. Who do you think is a relevant VC? It could be three weeks later that something pans out through a series of five conversations, but she's closing the loop with that first person to say, hey, the person you opened a door to me, opened a door to someone else who opened a door to someone else who actually resulted in capital. So thank you. And I just want to follow up and like appreciate what you did for me. And she does it constantly through, I mean, thank you notes every day. She's one of the most diligent people with the feedback loop that I've ever met. And it's taught me how important that is. Uh, and so I always, every time, I mean, I think in my mind, I always appreciated people and I don't think I necessarily showed it enough and showed it consistently enough. Um, but being able to sort of keep that archive, even years later, if something pans out, coming back and saying, hey, the advice you gave me, you know, three years ago still sits in my brain today and I appreciate it, uh, is really valuable. That, that is, I think that is a superpower. I mean, even being able to do that, that is phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that, Carolyn. Yeah, it um, takes time and it's its really building it into the fabric of your, your business and your culture. And it's something that we now, I mean, we're, we do internally in terms of just constantly showing appreciation for people. At the end of the day, we're pretty basic humans, right? Like we wanna feel appreciated and valued and we wanna feel like we're adding value to whatever it is that we're spending our time on. Um, so the more that you can sort of confirm that with others in every aspect, I think it just strengthens the relationship. It makes people want to do more for you. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and this is constantly telling me about, you know, how do you go ahead and build that network on top of the existing or, the, or even if you have a smaller network in your life and you're new into this field, how do you actually build that and, and get support from that constantly? So, uh, Carolyn, what do you, what do you think? Where does an entrepreneur who may or may not have a traditional network, like find mentors and start doing this uh, entire uh, thing of reaching out to them, asking for help, and then probably thanking them for the connections they were able to make? How, how do we even get started? For yeah, I think it is. Uh, I think it's so much easier today, honestly. I mean, think, obviously, the Internet, I think, has opened up like to find the people that are the pockets of people yeah. who are aligned with what you're doing is so much easier today than it used to be. I think about starting my first business, which was back in 2005. Right. I had no, I mean, there was one networking group that was a national networking group that I had to fly to visit to be a part of. There was nothing in Houston, or at least nothing that I knew of. Now, you know, you Google how to start a business in Houston and there's like or accelerators and organizations and all these pockets that are that exist to connect with. So the first thing I think is going and joining those groups. It is worth spending the time and carving out probably 25% 25 of your time at least of building a network in your space and getting to know either the small business or startup ecosystem, depending on kind of which bucket you fall more into, really getting to know those groups. 
uh, and adding value to them. So get involved in committees, volunteer your time, like give the effort uh, because it'll start to pull and open more doors. And I still, I mean, I still spend a lot of time mentoring because I find that it just opens up a lot of doors and I learn about things and I'm in circles and connecting with people that I had no idea yeah. existed. Um, yeah. So that's, that's one piece. I think the second is being very, very specific in your asks. Yeah. I get so many people that reach out and they're like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm starting a business. I would love your advice. Yeah. I'm like, my, my advice is all over the place. Like I've yeah. said it a million times. It's great. It's like very generic advice. I can shoot you an email and like yeah. bullet point it out for you. Right. I think what's where I find I can be most helpful is somebody coming and saying, look, I got, you know, whatever I'm thinking about making this hire and I'm between these two people and I'm kind of torn on which one should I hire, you know, here's the resumes, which one do you think might be more relevant for this position? When it's something really specific that you can give a response on, it's a lot easier to jump in and help and frankly use time really efficiently versus the very general abstract, help me build a business. I can't help a million people build a business, but I can answer questions you know, very quickly and all day long. And I think it adds more value to yeah. the owner. And it also shows that they're putting in the time to be like, what do they think I can be helpful with? I can't help with everything, uh, but I do have expertise in certain areas and people have taken the time to learn that. Yeah. It automatically makes me want to support them. Absolutely. And I, I love when you said it's much easier right now to just find things online and figure out what you need help with and then go for the people that you need to you know, ask help from. So the first thing is that clarity. What do I need? And why is this person the right mentor? Or why should I ask them for help? So that is such such an important advice. Um, Carolyn, what are the two or three actionable pieces of advice you would pass on to entrepreneurs? Uh, they, I'm, I'm sure the entrepreneurs are at different stages in this call, but what would be those actionable advice that you have learned as a Latina female founder and you would like to pass it on to other female founders that are thinking or scaling or growing their businesses? So one, I would say you be very, I think I touched on a little bit, be very specific in your asks, do your homework and build a relationship first. Don't just show up to somebody and throw a question at them and think that they you know, want to help you. They need to know about you. They need to trust you. They need to value you in the same way that, you know, that relationship is very two-sided. So look at every relationship as two-sided and, and invest in the relationship uh, and give back to that relationship and find ways that you can offer help and support um, consistently. It doesn't have to be that you're, you know, it's a give and take and a one-to-one -one match, but it might be that six months from now, you can go help somebody out. So take the time to go do it. Uh, or if you can help someone today, you never know. I'll take an example just for, for fun, a little tangent here, but we uh, were building a relationship with Verizon and we had gone through a series of people and finally got to the key decision maker at Verizon. And when we got on the phone, we had never met her before. We got on the phone and she was like, I just want to tell you what a huge advocate I am of what you guys are doing. She was like, you actually agreed to mentor me years ago uh, in a different career. Elizabeth and I had even started Hello Alice yet. And Elizabeth had helped her in this mentorship thing. She's like, I just want to tell you that you helped me so much. Uh, I reached out cold and you spent some time with me and I don't even know if you remember, but it made the biggest difference to me in my career. So now fast forward, this woman is making the decision for, you know, a million dollar contract with us. And who would have ever thought like it was just such a random you know, coincidence. But I think those situations, it's not the only time we've seen that. There's a lot of situations where we just invested heavily into a relationship and it hasn't panned out for years. We saw that a ton during the pandemic. We had been nurturing relationships, giving content, supporting a lot of these corporations. Wow. The pandemic hit, every corporation was like scrambling to figure out how to support small business. And they all came to us because we had been there, not asking for anything, just supporting and, and being there when, when they needed us. Yeah. So I think that's a, a huge piece is it's, don't think about the give and take, really think about the big picture of just being kind and giving. And I, I do truly believe that comes back. Yeah. Um, and then the other last piece of advice I will say is focus. It is particularly for those of you who you know, are building companies that are, where there's a lot of opportunity out there. I find there's sort of two buckets. Either you're trying to like plug a square, square peg into a round hole and it's not fitting, in which case I'd say open your eyes up and really be objective about are you on the right track or not. And if you're not, get on the right track or make some big changes. If you are on the right track, there's probably a lot of opportunities opening up to you and you have to stay very focused. 
Um, so really, you know, you should never be working on more than three things at a time for your company, particularly as a small business. So knock those out, do them very well, test them, either reinvest more into those or, or pick up some new, um, new focus areas, but you can't boil the ocean. And it's probably the one lesson I tell myself the most, because I'm always like, we can do this and there's this opportunity and let's go build this, but really staying focused and having a team that's going to hold you accountable for that or mentors. That is such good advice. And, and I'm going to ask a very difficult question now, Caroline. What is, what is the one time uh, that you took a huge risk and it paid off? And this is something, you know, I keep thinking as an entrepreneur as well, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs ask, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, your story is going it's to- It's 12 o'clock. Oops, your <laughs> story is going to actually inspire other founders as well. That huge risk, and it really paid off. I was the biggest risk for me always has been hiring. I'm a really, you know, I've like, I've had a business that's failed and it's closed and I've run out of money. And so I'm very conservative when it comes to spend. It's a very anti sort of Silicon Valley way of running a company. And given that we're in this, you know, this tech sort of startup land, we're always getting pushed to spend more and spend faster. And we have a lot of momentum behind us. Um, but I know how quickly things can fall apart too. And so I'm always very hesitant and thoughtful about hiring, um, it's always a risk. And particularly, I think there's been times where, especially in the early days, making those first hires where I knew there were things that I could do. It wasn't like it was rocket science in terms of what we had to build. And so I always sort of come to the mindset, well, I can take it on and I can, I can handle it. I was literally working at one point until you know, three or four in the morning, most nights. It got so bad. I was literally lying to my husband at what, what time I was going to sleep. He was like, where, what time did you go to bed last night? I'm like, oh, it was like midnight or one. And it was, I mean, I would, it was pulling all these all-nighters and I had an infant and I was a mess. I mean, you would like look at me the wrong way and I would break down. It was a mess. And I, I finally realized, I was like, we have to bring in more talent and we don't really have the money to do it, but we're going to make the jump and put the money out there. And it meant us fronting the bill. Uh, Elizabeth and I didn't take salaries at that point, And we were hiring a team around us with the hope that those employees would bring, you know, the capacity for us to bring in more money faster. And I think it was a thing that would have like, you know, for me, every time we hire, I'm like, we're putting somebody's livelihood into our hands and we're responsible for that paycheck. And I think anyone who's ever paid payroll, many of you on, on this call know that it's, it's very scary. But I look at every single hire as a huge risk. We don't know what they're going to bring to the table at the end of the day. We haven't worked with them and we're, we're believing in this person and they're believing in us that this is going to be a successful partnership. Um, but it's, we'll say it's paid off in space. We haven't made hundred percent of the correct hires. And I would say some of our past employees would probably agree <laughs> once we haven't made hundred percent right. Um, but they, but I do think it is, it's a really important decision and one that should never be taken lightly uh, on either side. And I think as an employee, I look back, you know, when I was an employee, I'm like, I wish I would have understood what a huge bet uh, my employer was taking on me too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think these early yeah. decisions, you can only see whether they paid off or not in retrospect, you just don't know as you're making these decisions at that time. And um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, I think making, letting an employee go is never easy. And I think we always really look at, it's a very personal decision, um, but you're impacting somebody's livelihood. But I do think the, the faster you make those decisions and the more transparent you are with the person on the other side of that, the better, because if it's not a good fit, letting them sort of linger around and just take home a paycheck is not helping their career either. And I do truly believe, I will say, even for the employees that we've had to let go, yeah. they all are incredibly talented. It might not have been a good fit for our company, but I've never had a doubt that there is a lot of value they can add to the table somewhere else. Um, so I think it's it's better to sort of let them go too and, and really looking at like a better decision for for both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and since you've talked about the internal stakeholders and a little bit about Verizon and external stakeholder that you collaborated with, I would love to know, have you collaborated with allies and strategic partners to create inclusive work and opportunities as well? Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, partnership is the core of our entire business model, in all honesty. Uh, it, it, 
started, I think, really just for being us trying to build awareness of what we were doing and starting to create that network. And it's become, uh, I think, probably our greatest differentiator in the market. We value every single relationship as very individual. We try to personalize that experience in the same way that we do for our owners on the platform. We're really personalizing the entrepreneurial journey for them. We're trying to personalize the partnership journey for each entrepreneurship, but really doing that at scale. We have over 3,000 organizational partners that we work with at Hello Alice. Uh, and it's, it's each one, I think, brings something very unique to the table. And we're trying to kind of also bridge those relationships and support other partners in, in bringing things together and collaborating. So it's, you know, I, I think as anybody is building a company, figuring out who are the big players in their space, where does it make sense to jump in? Not even big players, who are the little players too? We work with everyone from the NAACP to, you know, the local you know, rural chamber of commerce in, in a region. And both give us great insights and frankly, both bring us great opportunity in very different ways. So partnering with NASDAQ and then the Mentor Makers has been amazing. Uh, but any time that we feel like we can be of support to something, inevitably, I think those those partnerships pay off. Yeah, absolutely. And and going back to the mentorship as well, and I think uh, this is the other side of mentorship, the mentee side. What what accountability, Carolyn, should mentees have in mentorship, and what questions and support should they proactively ask and boldly ask for? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs. We, we feel scared just asking something. So what would you say there? The first is giving context. So I think in, in, in an email, the first, I mean, obviously you've got to build a relationship and have some, some sort of connection or it's really hard to come in cold and just show up. I always feel like that's a little bit awkward and, and weird. It really happens more, I think, in formal mentorship relationships, which maybe are lovely for some, but I've never had success in it myself. Uh, but I think showing up and giving context to so what do you need? Like, what are you building? What are you excited about? You've got to build passion. Like for, I think as entrepreneurs, we have this incredible passion for what we're building inevitably, or we wouldn't commit our careers to it. So take that, boil it down to like at its core, what are you very excited about for your business and share that uh, and give that context. Then it's really taking that context and asking the questions that you need so that the person is jazzed up because you want them to get excited. And that's on the mentee. Like the only way you're gonna get somebody excited about something is by actually genuinely being excited yourself. Uh, and it's hard. I think when you're feeling fear or anxiety or trying to survive, it's really hard to find the passion. But I always found it was helpful to go back like, and think about when I first started my company, you know, on day one, why did I quit my job at JP Morgan? What was the thing that made me jump into starting a business? And how can I take that excitement that I had, that I was willing to cut off a really great paycheck and jump into this business? What was it? Um, and when you kind of work backwards, I think you can boil it down a little bit and like channel the excitement all over again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and what should be the qualities of you? You think mentees, you talked about accountability, you talked about focus. What are the things that they should be representing in this mentorship relationship as well? I, I mean, there is an expectation from the mentor, but what can mentees do as well? Yeah, give, I mean, I think it's giving back, right? It's, you know, we are always just, again, giving thanks and appreciation for the time that they spend, um, knowing that it's, there isn't really an immediate direct benefit many times for them, but there are down the road. I had a mentor, um, a woman who started a really incredible company and now works in private equity and has invested in amazing companies. She's been a great mentor to me, uh, Janet Gerwich, who called me the other day to say, hey, I'm on a panel and I would love your insight because I think that what you bring to the table is going to offer me a lot of help. And so having that, being able to give back, again, you never know when it happens, but I think it's it's how are you also demonstrating your expertise? And when you're having those conversations saying, look, there's a ton that I can extract from you. But I think, you know, I think earlier when I was talking to Brooke before this call, everybody has something to offer and bring to the table. We all have this really unique journey through life. It might be because of your demographic and the life experiences you've had. It might be because you're a parent and you're dealing with certain things at home. It might be because you live in a certain region um, or the industry you work in. It doesn't matter necessarily. I think when we stop looking at sort of mentors up on this pedestal and mentees down here in terms of learning and just say, look, there's something that I can learn from you. 
and really start looking at everybody as your peer, the fear and anxiety goes away because you're not afraid to raise your hand and say, Hey, like, I have no idea how this works. Can you spend five minutes with me and just walk me through, you know, how do I avoid some of these obstacles or, or jump over this hurdle? And on the flip side, share your context. Like, look, here's what I've learned so far. Here's my perception on this thing. And here's kind of where I'm coming at it from, you know, any thoughts. And I think it's, it starts a conversation of equals versus a, oh my God, like, I don't, I'm trying to run a sort of business. I don't know what to do. And can you just help me? Like, that's so overwhelming to somebody. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like there's 8 trillion things you need to be doing to grow your business. But if we can narrow it down to a piece of it, I can, at least if I'm not the person can point you towards the right resource. Yeah, I, I, I love your aspect of giving back as well, because just the other example that you shared at Verizon, the executive actually was now in a position to give back and do that. And this is somebody who got mentored by you. So it, it is that cycle, which always would be there and keeps getting connected back to build this network, build it authentically, be accountable and keep giving back and it'll come back to you. Well, and I find too, you know, we work with a lot of, of, Fortune 500 organizations. And it's amazing to me, uh, and I'll use uh, Ajay Banga at MasterCard. MasterCard's an incredible partner of ours. Yeah. He is one of the most responsive humans. And you can imagine running a global enterprise like MasterCard, uh, or do you give a look because he's a wonderful Indian too. <laughs> so, uh, but, but running this global enterprise and the fact that he responds within you know 24 hours to an email from us and, and really supports the partnership is so meaningful and valuable. And he's personally made introductions. And I think when you realize, I'm like, when someone like that has the time to do it, everybody has the time if they're, if they're interested and if they believe in you. And so your job as a mentee is to give them enough evidence that yeah. you're someone worth believing in, right? That you're going to be responsive, that you're going to respect the relationships they open up to you, that you're going to respect and value their time. Uh, and that, again, just comes through conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I know we have to move to a Q&A, but I do have one last question before we do that, Carolyn. Um, Hello Alice is known as the intelligent business advisor for entrepreneurs. How do you define business advisor and what advice do you have for entrepreneurs on uh, knowing how to ask for that advice? Is it different from mentorship? What are your thoughts? Yeah, our goal was look at every step of your journey, you're making a lot of decisions. You're figuring out which payroll provider do you want to use? And, you know, is the lease agreement that you're looking at for your office space fair or not? Or what journey should you go down to try to get funding for your business? And there, the answer is different for everybody. So we found everybody's asking the same questions. There's a pretty limited set of questions that we ask for our business. But it's very different depending on where you live, depending on who you are and the resources you have at your disposal depending on the stage of growth you're at and the industry you're operating in, and ultimately what's important to you as an owner. And so we are, you know, our job as a, as a technology or as a platform is to learn as much as we can about you in the same way in an offline conversation that we would you know, ask these questions or try start to understand these questions and give a response. We're trying to aggregate all of this knowledge and say, okay, how do we extract everybody's expertise and knowledge yeah. aggregate that, look at trend data so we can really start to let sort of best in class knowledge rise to the top and then take into account who you are and what we should be recommending. Yeah. And I will say it will be my life's work because it's it's a never ending pool of information and it's always evolving and changing. Uh, but it's, you know, I think, again, when I look at the journey of entrepreneurship, it is so unique. And it's the reason we named our company Hello Alice is we always talk about the story of Alice in Wonderland, that you're in this world that's totally new and foreign to you. And you're, you feel really big at times, you feel really small at times, you're dealing with the unknown at every turn. And we really see every entrepreneur as Alice, right? You're, you took a leap of faith, you're jumping down this thing, you're trying to avoid these like crazy rabbit holes with your business. Uh, and if we can help navigate that to some degree, uh, what a cool and amazing outcome on the end. Like you get to create the world that you envision um, in the life that you want for yourself. Oh my God. I, I love that. I love that story behind the name, Carolyn. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I can, we always get asked why, uh, I saw that comment. Um, <laughs> from the, we always get asked why we named the company. Wow. Hello. It, it also it, happened. Elizabeth and I were both, we had really young kids at the time. We were reading the story of Alice in Wonderland yeah. and we had to name the company in like two days. So I'll give you like the 
the really great backstory too is that we're like, all right, we need a name and we need it tomorrow and we don't even have a logo and we're launching in two days. So what what can we trademark and what can we get? So Oh my God. I, I love that. And and it is it is such a visual name. The moment you tell the story it just puts everything to context. Why is it named this way and what what can be there? What can people get out of that? So that is a brilliant, brilliant name, I would say. Um, we have tons of questions and I'll try to go through as many as possible. Uh, there is one question from Clarine. Uh, she asks Caroline, how do we balance spending time contributing to groups, boards, networking, and simultaneously growing our business as well? So I have, um, I think, run both sides of the, the spectrum and I've given too much and have sort of lost focus on my own business. And um, I've, I've had a step back. So I think it comes in waves. I do think there's sort of periods of time early on. I feel like when you're building a business so much, you do have a little bit more time and flexibility. And even though it feels like you have a million things to do, you don't have the day-to-day -day sort of deadlines and pressures. And they're, they're mostly sort of personally put deadlines, right? If you say your launch date is May, it doesn't, the world doesn't really care if it's May or August, um, but you have a date that you've sort of put for yourself. So I think taking advantage of that period of time when you can spend a little more time and build a little bit more of a network and then carving out what is your expertise to your community and how do you focus on that? Don't try to just show up and be everywhere. You don't need to go to every panel, like you know, showing up at a million things, find out what is actually gonna be beneficial for you. Like if this conversation today is helpful for you, spend time here, um, but don't, you know, but your time might be better spent having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. And so you need to figure out what is the value to you of what you need to learn and go spend your time there. And that's great time spent because it's education. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, figure out where you can contribute and really focus on that area of expertise. And so you're, that's your kind of your give back. Uh, and then the rest of the time, and I always tell people you should be spending at least 80% of your time in the early days, especially. But even now I still try to live by this rule. 80% of your time on on growing your sales, like it in some capacity, like your activity should directly drive to increase sales for your business. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. easy to get distracted in all of the other things. Like I love to me, like brand building and, and market, like I love it. It's what I, I could spend all day just thinking about cool campaigns and what are we gonna do? But when I'm really like, all right, is this activity that I'm spending my time on today, the best use of my time to drive our top line? Right. If it isn't, I it doesn't count for my 80%. Right, right. And and uh, uh, that makes so much of sense, like the golden 80-20 rule, and it, it helps all the time. There's another question, uh, Carolyn, where um, I, the question, the person is anonymous, but they've said, hi, Carolyn, I'm in a position. Uh, you were when you spent two years on a startup that didn't work out. I realized a strong network and mentors is something I would like to build along other skill sets uh, before starting my next company. I'm evaluating my options now. The main idea I have is to join a great company and go from there. What path would you suggest do you have alternative suggestions? I would really look at why your company didn't work. And I think that that failed experience to me is great expertise uh, that can save someone a lot of time and energy. And also, what did you learn in terms of just broader skill sets from that? So if, if you're looking to go start your own venture next, I think in building the relationships, it's very different than if you're looking at joining a bigger company. Um, but with both of those, I would say don't be afraid to talk really transparently about your failed experience. I actually, I did a TED talk on failure uh, that was the first time I'd ever spoken about it. And it, the amount of sort of connectivity, I think that it brought and the outreach that it brought from people. It's something I'm super open about now. And in hindsight, I'm like, God, I should have talked about that much earlier, but I didn't even tell my family when my company was failing, I was really embarrassed. And it was the first thing I'd sort of poured all my energy into and failed at. And the, the one lesson I learned was again, like people, people want to see you succeed and everybody loves an underdog. Like they, they want to root for you. Like we're built on a country that just, like we love to see people that everybody's doubted succeed. Uh, and if you can be like, go be the underdog and embrace that identity because it's, it's awesome. I mean, I think it really does help people push you and, and you're gonna open doors through that failed experience that you probably would have never opened if you'd been on this sort of fast track 
to success. And also you don't have to keep up the facade at all, right? When everybody thinks you're this growing company and there's always stuff going on behind the scenes, no matter what stage you're at. When you failed, you get to be really transparent with everything and you learn that doors that actually open when you're when you show that vulnerability and when you're really transparent with with where you are. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and oh my God, I, I've been through this journey. It was just as I was listening to you, was, yes and yes and <laughs> even now when I talk about failures, especially to my family, they tell me, but but you said everything was great. Why did you tell us? <laughs> I do think like culturally that plays a lot. I mean, I coming from a, a Hispanic family, it's you know, appearance is, yeah. is everything, right? And so we're sort of taught that like you smile and show up and everything's wonderful. And you would never let anybody know like everything that's falling apart in your life. And I, that was the, the sort of turning point for me was yeah. it's so exhausting. Like you can't keep that up forever and that you're, you're not bringing in the help that you need until you embrace the failures. And, and that's what, it's amazing how people come out of the woodwork and they're like, oh my God, I've been through that too. And I don't know, totally. I think it's, it's totally. finding those commonalities. Yeah, yeah. Um, Karen, there's a question about, um, I am working on a startup for helping people develop soft skills uh, that are important for success. That is emotional intelligence, communication through content and peer practices and giving them automated insights. Uh, and I think they're thinking about fundraising. And the question is, how would you think about fundraising for such a startup? Uh, we talked about relationships and I will say every dollar of capital that we've brought in through Hello Alice, even to date has been through a relationship. Uh, I always hear, you know, we talk about women and, and people of color really struggling in this space, even men struggling in this space and even white men struggling in this space. It is very, very hard. And at the end of the day, especially in your early stages, you have to build trust. And the only way to build trust is letting somebody know you and know your work ethic and know how you operate. Um, so build those relationships. I think, you know, get to know venture capitals as humans and not as wallets. Uh, they're, the reality is most of them are gonna say no but we, we had a policy at our company and still do that every time we talk to somebody, we're giving them updates. We give them, we include them in our quarterly updates, whether mm -hmm. we're raising capital or not. Mm -hmm. And so we had, I mean, just to put in perspective, the person who led our seed stage uh, told us no three times. And as we kept growing in our fundraising for our seed stage that lasted forever, uh, we reached out to over 600 companies at 600 VCs. Uh, finally came back around and because he saw so much momentum from the time we'd started the conversation to the time we sort of last sent an update, uh, he, he bought into it and really bought into us more than, more than the company. In our series A, it was the same thing. We had started going down the traditional venture route. And I mentioned John Cena, Silicon Valley Bank. Again, it was really very much a bet on us because of the relationship that we had and because we had, we had partnered on different things. We'd worked with them in different capacities. It was all about the relationship that we'd started in a very different world. And so keep the updates coming and show people your traction. And if you say you're going to accomplish a goal, follow up and just say, even if they're not interested, be like, hey, just wanted to let you know, you know, we said we were going to grow 25% and look, we grew 20, we grew 30% or, you know, we, we did this and we're stumbling a bit, but like this other area, we're really thriving. And so we're going to put more you know, time and investment here, but always be selling the story and always be selling your commitment and your passion and your follow through. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we still even now have investors that say, hey, look, there's, there are a lot of ways you can monetize. There's a lot of ways that you can create this billion dollar business. We, we believe in you all because of the passion and commitment that you have for the owners that you support. And so I think if you're always communicating that and you're, you're genuine and, you know, it's a crapshoot at the end of the day, venture capital is, it's like the wild west still. And so if you, if you can be the best opportunity for them at a moment in time, that's the way to get capital, but you've got to be in front of them all the time in order to be the best at a moment in time. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is such great advice. Uh stick to your why and be in front of them all the time. A no can become a yes, if you're yes. So. I mean, we we laugh because we're, we have, I think one of our investors on our V, we came back and we were like, all right, we, we really think you should lead the round and here's why. And they just, they're like, you guys are like the most persistent humans that we've ever seen. And we are, but we're, 
you, you strip away the pride as not someone once described raising funds as they're like, you know, it's like you have this beautiful baby that you're so proud of yeah. and you show them to somebody and they just look at it and tell you all the ways that's the ugliest baby in the world. <laughs> and you're like, and you're sitting there holding it and being like, okay. And you just have to smile and nod and take it and walk out the door. Uh, and I was like, that is, that is raising money. It is, you have to let the nose, like it has to fire you up because if you let it break you down, it's going to destroy you. Yeah. My God, that, that is the, the fundraising metaphor that I love and hate at the same time. Oh my God. It's exhausting. It is my least favorite part of running a business. Um, but also I do think going through the process makes you learn so much about your business. So it's, it's worthwhile, but it's exhausting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question, Caroline, from Brad, who says, do you value writing a short business plan that is iterated at regular intervals? We operate off of quarterly objectives. And we always, as a team, at a high level, set three core goals uh, that we're going to accomplish as a team. Then we bring our leadership team together to put the strategy behind it. How are we actually going to accomplish it? And that's what we're holding ourselves to over the course of the quarter. So we, we really don't, I would say I probably spend more of my time like thinking really big picture kind of long-term and then relaying that context to our leadership team so that they can sort of iterate off of that and play off of it. But it's very um, informal. I think it's usually like a PowerPoint deck or something. It's not really any kind of formal business plan. I do think it's that sort of the job of you as the founder of the company is constantly keeping a lens on the, the long term and the growth plan and making sure you always believe in it. Um, but I think when it comes to execution, like that stuff changes so much these days that it's, it's keeping it lean and it's keeping it like very flexible and dynamic, but keeping it firm enough that the team has direction and a North Star in terms of what they're building. Uh, but I always find it really like for us, it's, it's a blend of PowerPoint decks and constantly like we every week are hammering in on like one aspect of it to the team because it could be so firm in your mind, but they're seeing one piece, like they don't have the broader context that you have. And so you always have to be like lifting them up to the big picture of, you know, giving them a rationale of why they're working on the things they're working on and also helping them realize that they can't deviate too far off the path because it's going to it's going to derail the big picture. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, another question uh, from actually a college student uh, who's asking, how do you define a partner? Uh, you said you have over 3,000 partners. How do you define a partner? How do you approach the give and take relationship when you're excited about what the other company is doing? and you see great opportunities to work together. I'm working on a startup as, as a college student and feel unsure how to navigate the legality and formality of business partnerships. We, when we started, it was super informal. It was us you know, going to an entrepreneurial group, talking to someone, and most of those are, are nonprofits and very small organizations. So I really started just very focused on the city of Houston. Elizabeth started focused in, in the county of Sonoma and we just got to build relationships. And so there wasn't really a need for formal agreements or partnerships. It was us learning what they needed and plugging in how we thought we could help with the goal always of saying, how are you going to open up your group of entrepreneurs to us? Yeah. As, it, as it grew, we got smarter about what those partners needed. We started seeing a lot of commonalities and saying, you know, okay, we're doing all these things manually. We can automate this small piece of it. And so let's build a system around it. And we would create a solution. And then we gradually have just continued to sort of chip away at what that suite of services is. And then also now we're starting to see these major commonalities between corporations and governments and entrepreneur organizations realizing they all actually want the same thing and we can help them all. Um, so we've really scaled up and ramped up that program, but it's still, I mean, we have increased the size of our team to help manage those relationships and started building more things about like convening the ecosystem and bringing different partners together. And so always trying to figure out how do we, how do we add value, but how can we add value at scale? And then when needed, we can dive really deep with specific partners. So for example, when Black Lives Matter, uh, came to the forefront of conversation. We went really deep with the NAACP and black and brown founders and 
Div Inc. and all these organizations, big and small, but we brought them together and said, all right, what can we do as a community of communities to help support the entrepreneurs and what are the roles that we can each play? And that role of convener became, is still so valuable. I mean, I meet monthly, we have a Hispanic round table where we do the same thing uh, or with the LGBT community. And so just think about how can you start to sort of segment those big partner groups over time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we wouldn't be able to go through all the questions. There are so many questions, Carolyn. But uh, before we end today's event, I do want to make sure that uh, all the attendees who are here today, uh, we would love for you to join us for our next Mentor Maker experiences that include the Mentor Makers Live, uh, where we have special guests from Techstars family, including Brad Feld, Ian Hathaway, and Claudia Ruter. This is happening on Thursday, April 22nd at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And then we have a Mentor Makers virtual breakthrough cafe hosted by AARP on Monday, April 26th at 9 a.m. Pacific. And uh, thank you so much, Carolyn, for taking the time to speak to our community, sharing your insights and being so candid and giving us such a, such a great overview of everything that you're doing at Hello Alice and everything about your entrepreneurial journey on behalf of the NASDAQ's Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today. We sincerely thank you for joining us. Well, thank you and thank you to, to NASDAQ. I think what you're doing and just making these matches and bringing people together is so valuable. Like I said, I think mentorship has played a huge piece of, of my journey, certainly. And our GD, your questions were so wonderful. So thank you. Uh, but for all of those questions I didn't get to answer, if I can ever be of help, uh, all of you can find me. I, I'm every day over at the Hello Alice community. Uh, I'll put the link here in the in the chat, uh, but it's just helloalice.com. You can sign up for free and, and uh, we'd love to help support and always are funneling people back over here because I think these mentor sessions are so valuable. Thank you. Thank you once again, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody.